This is Rita Carl, Director of Education for Challenger Center for Space Science Education. Today's guest is Dr. Alan Stern, a planetary scientist and former Associate Administrator of the NASA Science Mission Directorate. Dr. Stern is also the Principal Investigator for NASA's New Horizons mission to Pluto. Most planets seem to have some sort of atmosphere, so why is ours here on Earth unique, appearing of all the other atmospheres in our solar system we've been able to observe to sustain life? Boy, if I knew the answer to that question, I would really be happy. No one really knows. But it looks like it's actually a symbiotic connection between life on Earth and the atmosphere of the Earth. That is, when the, we know that when the Earth was very young, its atmosphere was very different. For example, there was very little oxygen. But with the rise of plants that release oxygen into the atmosphere, the amount built up, and that made it possible for animals to evolve on the land. And so our atmosphere is very different than any of the others in our solar system. And that's probably related to the biology on Earth. We're very lucky. So we've talked about planets, and we've talked about moons, and we've talked about the sun. So what about the asteroid belt? How did it form, and why is it different from the other bigger objects in our solar system? Well, the asteroid belt, which is between Mars and Jupiter, is believed to be a place where a planet could have formed but never did, probably because Jupiter's nearby gravity disturbed the region so that we couldn't accrete a large enough planet. And things never really got past the size of dwarf planets like Ceres that are there. Interestingly enough, there's another belt in our solar system called a Kuiper belt beyond Neptune, which is also populated only by smaller bodies and dwarf planets. And we see those same kinds of belts in orbit around other stars. How many solar systems are there in the universe? Well, that's a big number. In our galaxy, there are between 1 and 200 billion stars, and it's beginning to look like solar systems are common. They're certainly not rare. We already know that more than 10% of the stars have solar systems. It may be that almost 100% do, but we just can't see yet because our techniques aren't good enough yet to be sure that we're finding them all. So in our galaxy alone, there are probably between 20 and 100 billion solar systems, and our galaxy is one of just billions. So it's a very large number of solar systems out there. With a lot of different types of planets. That's right. And a lot of different types of moons, and also a lot of different types of star systems. And can you talk a little bit about star systems that have more than one sun? I once heard from my astronomy professor when I was in high school that if Jupiter had been larger, we might have had a two-sun solar system. And he also said that it's very common to have binary star systems. In fact, most stars are in multiple star systems, binaries, triples, even quadruples rarely five or six suns, but we have already found examples of planets orbiting in binary systems. So it gets more interesting all the time. It would be really interesting to have two sunrises and two sunsets every day. My last question is about life. We talked about the symbiotic relationship between our atmosphere and the evolution of life on our planet. In all of these billions of suns and billions of galaxies that imply billions of solar systems. Do you think life has evolved in other solar systems on other worlds? Well, I tend to think that um, uh, the odds are certainly in, in that favor, but you know, until we have the evidence as a scientist, I have to say the jury's still out. And that's what's so exciting about scientific exploration, is you get to pose these really fascinating questions. And, and then working with uh, engineers and technologists find the techniques, the tools that allow us to do this amazing exploration from Earth or from Earth orbit. And then we'll know the answer someday. You're the principal investigator on the mission that's going to Pluto. And Pluto is just like the most exciting planet to kids for a really long time because it was the last planet. So what do you looking for? What, what do you hope to find when your spacecraft with your science gets to this far, far distant location, this outer planet? Well, you know, earlier I was saying that the dwarf planets are the, the most populous class of planet in our whole solar system, maybe in the universe. And 
in 50 years of space exploration, we've sent a lot of missions to the planets, dozens to Mars, for example, dozens to Venus and the Moon, eight missions now to Jupiter, for example, several to Saturn, and yet we have never, ever yet sent a probe to reconnoiter a dwarf planet. We have never explored the most populous class of planet in our solar system. And so I expect us to be highly surprised because it's all about unwrapping a package and seeing what's really there. Pluto's going to go from a single point of light in most telescopes, and even in the Hubble, barely resolved as a disk, to a real world. We'll have images from New Horizons almost as good as Landsat images of the Earth and spectra and samples of its atmosphere and a much better understanding of its moons and it's going to teach us a great deal about both the formation of planets and how dwarf planets operate. So it's going to be really exciting. Thank you so much for joining us this time and, and all the other times you've been with us. We really appreciate it. Thanks, Rita. It's this fun. is Rita Carl, Director of Education for Challenger Center for Space Science Education with our special guest, Dr. Alan Stern. For more information about Challenger and to hear more podcasts, visit www.challenger.org. And for more about the origin of the solar system and NASA's missions, including the New Horizons mission to Pluto, please visit www.nasa.gov.